you welcome back from the break and that is what happens when you miss a former colleague and you really mean to engage with him um, like i made mention before we went for break uh, today we'll be engaging with mr kwesi akwasam who used to be a staff um, of the association of african universities the universities as the head of student affairs and currently the sixth president of the grassack usa in maryland university hello mr sam are you with us Mr. Kwesi Sam, you're welcome to Hello Africa Morning Show. Thank you so much. <laughs> Good to see you. I was really, really wishing to uh, meet you on, on today's um, show. Yeah. Good to see you once again. And I really miss you. see you. Great. Yes, I miss you all. And my regards to everybody back home. Right. Uh, thank you. So before we begin, um, I'd like you to share with us your journey from Ghana. You started here from Ghana before going to the U.S. Um, and also um, taking the role as a sixth president of the Grass Act U.S. in Maryland University. Can you share with us and the journey so far from Ghana to the U.S.? Wonderful. I, I don't know. That, that's a very big one. I don't know where to, to start from. But I did my first and second degrees at the University of Cape Coast. Um, I read B.S. in psychology at, um, from 20, 2008 to 2012 and then right after that did my master's um in the same field as well and joined the association of african universities in 2016 where i had the privilege of working um with a lot of um professors and academics in general on the continent establishing higher education projects and all then um moved right from 2021 to University of Maryland for my PhD studies. And so for Grassag, I've been with Grassag for quite some time. So back in the University of Cape Coast, I served as the general secretary um, for Grassag, and then later on became the national secretary as well. So when I go to um, University of Maryland, I joined the Grassag USA version and um, a year after I decided to go in for the present position just to be able to establish um, some projects and programs that will really support or benefit the entire Ghanaian graduate student in the United States. So that has been a brief of my journey right from Ghana into uh, my PhD and then into Grassag uh, in, in America. That is quite an impactful journey. Now, let's take it back to um, you being, when you were in AAU, um, you were part of, or you were the organizer, you were American University's Olympic um, hosted in ages five years ago. I would like you to share with us how you were able to, I mean, come up with this initiative, especially with the universities, African Universities Olympics. Then we come to the postgraduate student research training, which you also initiated here in AAU and also the Agenda 2063 Student Engagement Series. Share with us on these initiatives. Yeah, that's that's quite a lot. Um, so we started the whole idea back in 2019, um, AAU in partnership with Al Azhar University. And so Al Azhar, I'm sure they still host our North African office um, in Egypt. And so we, right after the inauguration of the North Af North African um, office of the AAU, we're looking at strategic programs that will support both um, the, the northern part of Africa and then the southern as well. And for students, one of the areas that was going to benefit everybody was true sport. And so we were, the vision was to look out for possible um, outlet to bring all students on the continent together beyond um, the, the academic roles and things that we do. So we came up with the African Olympics, um, African Higher Education Olympics, which was hosted by the Al Azhar University, and I think was part of the AAU's um, inauguration programs in in Egypt. And so we had University of Cape Coast, we had University of Ghana, we had um, UDS as well, and I think we had University of Education Winneba, and some universities in Nigeria and other parts of the continent um, 
competing for the very first time and it was really awesome and um, we had all the track event and i'm watching the current olympics and i saw some of our athletes who were within the same process and benjamin azamati was a student at the university of Canada at the time who competed in the process and then we had also uh, one high jumper from university of cape coast i think rose um yes i've forgotten the same name but rose also uh, participated in that process as well then we had i think the university of cape coast winning most of the the uh, the um the sessions um they booked the track and then other event as well so that was that and we just also so my role as the head of student affairs was to create a lot of pathways for students and so we did a graduate um industrial training program where at the time the vision was to create extra pathways for students um, to do internships at the AAU. And so the goal was to bring them together and then help them develop a project. So we brought IT student, we brought business um, and commerce, we brought um, communication student and other disciplines um, together to be able to develop a research hub or bank um, for the African continent in a sense that if any industry player needs um, some research assistant, they can just go directly into that database, pick up um, the, the resources that were available. So it was amazing. We brought these students together to be able to develop the hub, um, the research bank. Um, and I think at the time I was leaving the AAU at the point of harvesting data into the database for industry players to use. And that was under AAU's um, academic industry partnership so the best way was for us to really kind of create a synergy between industry and then um universities then beyond that i think um there were other projects that um, we did to support students and um, we did a lot of mentorship programs and and others as well so uh, there are some of them i may have even forgotten um but they were quite like um, i think about 15 projects and programs that were able to initiate under that as well, including the AUTV. Hello. Chief Jenny uh, with Grassac USC. Um, can you repeat the question? I think I missed you a little um, bit. Uh, we want to know how has your role and also your experience at the AAU before moving to US, how has your role and also your experience um, shaped your leadership journey um, with the Grassack USA? I think it has really, um, my role at AAU um, really made a significant impact in my leadership here uh, at Grassland USA. One of the things is resource mobilization. And so I really learned a lot about resource mobilization throughout my period at AAU. Um, I was the lead, uh, one of the lead facilitators for the resource mobilization workshops for African universities. So I was working with uh, Professor Paul Ventura, we went to South Africa, um, Cape Town to be specific, um, to host workshops for university um, professional. And then later on, um, had the privilege of working with Professor Rose Mombohine, who is the Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of Cape Coast as well, um, in Namibia, Rwanda, and other countries as well. And so mm -hmm. when I got into uh, Grassag USA, one of the areas that we needed much more support was resource mobilization. Mm -hmm. And so I leveraged on those skills and then the knowledge I had acquired throughout my work in AAU to create resource mobilization pathways mm -hmm. for the association because that was what we really needed at the time. And again, I had built a lot of um, partners, right? And so working with AAU gave me the opportunity to work with various um, industry players and then others in the higher education ecosystem, not only in, uh, in Africa, but also in the United States. So it was kind of very easier for me to really leverage on those platforms and build strategic partnerships um, for the association, especially mm -hmm. who the first conference ever as, as an association in the United States. It was really important that um, we, we brought in other stakeholders um, on the continent and then also within um, the United States as well. So my, my role 
And what I did in AU, I learned a lot of diplomacy. And I think being the president in the United States, diplomacy is really one of the things, working with the ambassadors and working with other um, high level dignitaries um, in, on, in the United States. Um, I think that diplomacy is one of the, the key things that we need. And I was able to acquire all of that through AU. And then leadership is, is one of the things I have back on the continent again, working with vice chancellors and working with high profile personalities across our universities. Mm. I, I kind of learned a lot of um, cultural sensitivity and all of that. And all these skills and um, that really helped me in my leadership as, as the grassroot president. Interesting. Um, now, talking about uh, resource mobilization, um, during the GRASAC USA inaugural Congress, lined five strategic goals, and as part of the goals, uh, you have established the GRASAC USA Endowment Fund and also the GRASAC USA Giving Day um, Fund. On um, all these named in honor of the founding executives and also uh, executives, and these are some of the strategies um, you have, you've established to mobilize resource. Now, what inspired you um, to establish this initiative, and how do you see them benefiting future students and also members of the association? Oh, thank you so much. Um, so one of the things um, when I was going into the vetting process to be the president, I had already gone into the archives from 16 um, when the first president, Dr. Juliet Ohimin Tiamua, and her team established GRASAC. And right from that period, um, one of the major problems or the challenges for the association was just fundraising pathways um, that was kind of very missing. And as the association grew in numbers, um, we were receiving a lot of requests from from students. And so students who didn't have stipend, students who went out on full funding, students who were going into medical emergencies and those who were struggling with some um, food insecurities and all um, across um, the, the, the state were reaching to us. Again, we also had our colleagues from Ghana um, who, so we call them prospective students, those who would want to apply to grad school in the US. They were also struggling with application fees and day in and day out, they would write to the, the association for support, which we did not have at the time. And so one of the key things that my executive um, at my administration, we took upon ourselves was to really establish that financial, um, um, I don't know, standing so that we'll be able to support a lot of our members. And that really kept us on and we decided to establish the endowment fund. One of um, the, I don't know, the unfortunate situation that event propelled us to do this was, uh, I think the summer of 2023, we lost some of our students to car accident in the United States. And within the heat of that moment, GRASAC had to really provide some strategic support um, to, to our members, which were not in the best position to provide any substantial um, support in terms of finances. So some of these things really um, prepared us of like, look, we need to really establish these endowment funds and these uh, fund, um, giving the fundraising streaming process to really help us expand our uh, goal aimed at raising 200,000 US dollars to support members' academic and welfare needs, which um, we are not able to hit our target, but we, we did fairly well in, in raising some good amount of money for the association. And I believe that the systems that we've placed, uh, well, we've put in place, which um, gives everybody access to donate to our website and then other platforms. We believe that in the next two, three years, we should be able to hit our target and be at a place where Grassa will be financially stable to provide um, the support that it needs to its members. Look at the other four strategic goals, which um, includes initiatives to enhance um, inclusivity, the sense of belonging, among others. Share with us some of the uh, achievements and also the challenges you encountered while working towards achieving the goals. It's, it's a lonely journey. Um, we encounter a lot of challenges, um, one of them being um, loneliness is, is, is really very, very real. And so back home um, in Ghana, 
you could just walk from your home to somebody's and then chat if you were ever lonely or even in the offices you can just walk into somebody's office and have a very good conversation um, with people but here the culture is not that way and so when our grad students really come into the united states they they, they face that um that challenge right and and so we decided to go a much more deeper and provide a lot of engagement pathways and platforms for our members and we decided to break the association down further into five regions um, that we believe that will help us organize programs that will impact our members directly at the grassroots level so we had the grass act northeast we had grass west we had grass act south southeast and southwest and then um, we had a grass act west so we had leadership or regional coordinating secretaries um, at these um, levels and their role was to really organize programs for members and engage them um, at that level and and make sure that at least members felt welcome they felt needed and they felt like they belonged to a mother association so we, for once in a while we'll bring them together on a bigger platform like on zoom where um, we organize some karaoke um, like people will sing and they will win raffles to buy groceries and others and then also um, the main goal was to bring all of them together this summer at the University of Maryland to see ourselves for the very first time. Um, it was so interesting that we had people who had worked within the last seven years supporting GRASSAC and they had not had opportunity to meet face to face. But then during the Congress, they were able to um, to do that. So breaking down the leadership of the association, making it much more decentralized was really one of the pathways that helped um, our members as well. Then there were other things that um, we did in terms of programming um how so after graduate school in the united states what next everybody is looking for pathways um to really um either work in the united states or if they are they want to come back to ghana or to any part of the world how do we facilitate that process as a graduate um, student association and these are some of the significant things and uh, programs and support that we need to help our members um, have the knowledge the skill um, to be able to do that or to be able to transition um, after after school as well. So surprisingly, we're able to hit on all our five um, strategic indicators for the academic year and um, GRASAG is, is I, I don't know, um, we had all at this moment, we had our election, which I thankfully have a successor and a, a wonderful team, which I believe that they will be able to do the work that um, we have left off and even do it much more better. Great. Um, now, being the president um, of the GRASAC USA, I know for sure that you've been approached with some challenges facing students. And also, you may know about um, the present challenges facing higher education in Africa. Um, share with us what mm. innovative solutions can be implemented to address uh, these challenges. So, I think um, I... Well, and I need to be very strategic in answering this question. So I love that everybody would want to study in the United States. I love that everybody will have the chance to study abroad because that really is helpful. You get the chance to engage with people in different cultures and engage people, um, at various levels. So in terms of those cross-cultural engagements and having access to different learning um, pathways. It's, it's something that you can never take out of the experience that we have here. The only challenge is that I wish people prepare much more better before they, they embark on these processes. So for example, some students will wait at the very last minute when they finish their national service and they are not getting jobs in Ghana, then they would want to jump on, oh, I, I hear people are traveling on education. And so I, I also would want to and they go online through the service and support of others. They find schools and then, yes, um, when they find schools, some of them don't have full funding, others also have full funding, and then the process begins and they jump on. There are others also who would want to, to go through the same process, but they do not adequately prepare. I think that if students will prepare themselves very well, if you want to come to study in the United States or study in any part of the globe, I think that if you are an undergrad, 
you should start preparing even in your final year. Having access to the right CGPA is great. Um, you being able to write a very good um, statement of purpose or proposal in some um, higher education regions or so in the United States, you don't really need a proposal like that. And so preparing adequately is something that I would throw out the word of that as grassa. I would always ad advise our people to really pay much attention to it. And so some do get rejected in the process of in the application process, just not just because they are not good, but because maybe they did not really spend much more time in writing a very creative statement, statement of purpose or paying attention to, to detail in the application process. So I believe that if we will be able to provide much more adequate support to our student, if they want to transition to higher education in the diaspora, I think the government and um, and this one I'm speaking spe specifically to Ghana uh, must be able to really enhance that that process as well. Apart from the government um, scholarship that they provide, which I know is is tailored through the scholarship secretariat in Ghana, there is no adequate support for students who come in to the United States or to other uh, regions to study. And I believe that once they come in. Um, to study, they are still the, the the asset of the nation, and so in terms of providing adequate support, that special pathway to to know and to find out how they are doing and how um, the academic process or journey is going, and how can they be of huge benefit back um, after their school back to the nation. These are some 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 conversations that we need to have, and I'm glad that throughout our administration we're able to have that uh, partnership with the embassy and creating some of these conversation um, platforms with the embassy to make sure that at least we the embassy is better positioned to provide support to the students who are in the diaspora because look if you're able to provide adequate support to them they would go through the school process and they'll come back um, home even not in in person whatever they do will benefit um, the, the the country at large so those are some of the things but in terms of the entire higher education on the continent, I think that, and I tell people, there is no significant difference in the content that we study okay. here in the United States and in the diaspora. There's no, the very things that we used to study back home is, is the same content, but the difference is the approach, the teaching method, and the difference is the resources that students have here, which is um, not the same back home right and so the psychology content that i studied university of cape because i may be doing the exactly same in the united states but the teaching method is different okay so there are different pedagogical skills there are different projects they are hands-on and so you finish school and then you know i quite remember when we we're finishing um, our first degree um level 400 psychology some of my mates asking me what do i do with this degree what do i do with this certificate right but here in the united states before students even get to their their senior years and they are graduating right there are a lot of internship pathways in the school system there are a lot of career pro programs and all there are a lot of matching so nobody uh, is left behind in terms of looking for what next to do and so these are some of the things that are kind of missing in in our system on the continent and that is why i am very much passionate in student affairs and student development how do we position our universities in in a way that will better support student learning outside the classroom so if i am coming back to the continent i'm much more interested in how the out of class engagement and everything translate to the entire knowledge ecosystem that students build or um, leverage on whilst they are still in school. And these are very, very important. So you don't wait till the four years or the two years or five years of your study before you are thinking about what next to do. And so being intentional, be purposeful in the educational planning process is what is much more needed. Creating those pathways with industry players, having students study abroad, um, students have access to resources and mm. all. So I am, my university is closer to Washington DC. And as a student, there are times they take us back to the higher education institutions in DC and have the chance to learn and also ask the critical questions with these industry players. So you understand what you study in the classroom. So you don't wait till you finish your four year or five years degree and you are now going to leverage or you are now going to work with industry players. So these are some of the, the conversations we're having back home 
um, whilst I was working with AAU, and I think they are still much more relevant. How do we make sure that our students have the best of everything? Um, and, the, and, and we have the resources back home, and I am very confident about that. But being intentional and being purposeful and being strategic is what is missing. These are the missing links, and I believe that um, we will be able to do something to really support that process, uh, maybe after school, who knows? Okay, um, thank you for your um, in the insights shared. Now, looking forward, um, what are your hopes and expectations for the future of um, the association and also how can it continue to grow and support its members? So I'm very confident and hopeful um, um, for, for Grassag and I just, just want to thank all, all the past executives, right from the founding executives to my um, administration. I think every administration brings in a unique um, set of skills and vision that moves the association from one level to the other. And so I am very hopeful that the, the things we've been able to do, um, we've been able to set the grounds for the association to flourish. And that is what I always tell people. And so I'm very much hopeful that Grassag next year Yes, next year there's going to be another Congress, which will be bigger and better than what we did this time. I'm so much hopeful that they will be able to raise a lot of um, um, money, right, to support our members because of the partnership we've already created in terms of um, organizing programs. All these things are set and advocacy for our members at, across um, the various universities are uh, there. Um, one of the vision that the current president, Mr. Victor Kojode, shares is that he wants to set up um, Grassag at the various um, institutions. So we are going to have, just as we used to have in Ghana, Grassag, UCC, Grassag, Legon, and all. We He is moving the association to the next level where we're going to have, let's say, Grassag, Maryland, Grassag, um, Wisconsin, saying that. So then that helps us even um, get in touch with our members and much more and then provide the adequate support that they need. So I think that is, is, is really exciting and I'm very much hopeful that the next administration will flourish and do more um, according to the strategic goals that we've set for the association for the next 10 years. I, I must say that I like the fact that you made mention you're looking forward to coming back to Ghana and also to impact on Africa's higher education. Now, um, as a doctoral student in the uh, specializing in higher education, student affairs, and also international policy, I know your research interest is going to be in this field. Now, how do you plan to mm. contribute to um, the higher education system and also student affairs with your interest in uh, the, uh, the field you are specializing in? Sure. So I. Um so I, I always, I'm always interested in the processes in the universities. So my research goal and interest, I'm always looking at how university-wide policies really impact students with marginalized identities, right? So when it comes to Ghana, there are students who are disabled, right? Students who, um, we don't even use the term anymore, who have um, special needs. There are students who are not the, the traditional university student. We have students who go through a lot of challenges and students who have academic challenges and all. How do we ensure that everybody, right, and the word is everyone um, who applies to go through the school system is not left behind. So how do we set up policies that really support students, whether you're coming from a rich home, you're coming from a good senior high school or not, or a deprived high school or not, um, how do we provide adequate support services to all students so that everybody will thrive um, um, academically, socially, everybody will develop psychologically, everybody will have access to the basic um, 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 resources that every university has in Ghana. And um, my focus is not just only on Ghana, in, in Ghana, but in the entire continent. So how do we revamp um, student um, affairs practice on the, on the entire continent. I remember that back home, I began the establishment of um, a network which brought together all student affairs, practitioners and deans um, across the continent. And that is one of the ways um, I'm still working on that um, whilst in grad school, but how to really retool. So we do not 
technically have student affairs practitioners. Most of us are paraprofessionals on the continent, right? And so how do we uh, provide academic support services? How do we provide professional development services to them? And how do we create even academic content, okay, for um, the vice chancellors, the, 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 level, the top or the mid-level managers of our universities to have a blueprint to use to really um, kind of support students across uh, the various institutions on the continent. So that is my 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 vision and my goal. My goal is that at least all the processes in our universities work. So you know every organization has an HR, right? But how? So student affairs is just going to be that part for our student. It's an institution that is providing every adequate support that students need. That is a missing link in our education on the continent, being intentional in the support services that we offer to students. And I believe that when you do that for students, not only in the classroom, but then outside the classroom, there are a lot of classroom, outside the classroom engagement, that if we are very intentional about that, we will be able to compete globally and, and do the very things that we, we want to do. And I indicated, the things that we do here in the United States or in the diaspora, they are not too different, right? But it is just about how intentional, how purposeful that we kind of engineer our resources to support students adequately, regardless of who they are, where they come from, and what challenges they are facing within the school system. Our school system is such that if you are not, so, you know, we train you, Everybody must fit into the box because of the the, the resources that we, we have, right? But we need to create a lot of pathways to ensure that student, no matter who you are, no matter your your circumstances, you need to thrive, you need to be successful, and you need to go through the school system um, adequately. Here we have students who have special needs and we, we are with them in the classrooms, right? And so we have all the, the classrooms are set in such a way that all the school systems are set in such a way that everybody is able to have the best um, access to everything within the school system. We don't have that back home, right? Or even if we do, there are a lot of challenges. So these are some of the things that we just want to revamp or just kind of um, see how best we'll be able to work around to provide a lot of services to enhance higher education and student affairs on the continent. So that's what I want to do right after my PhD, beyond the research and then the policy things that we'll be doing. But everything that I will be doing is university policies and how do these policies and resources really um, transform student um, holistically, even before they graduate? How does that make them much more employable, marketable, and how are they able to develop their skills? So setting up those systems in the universities is something that is dear to my heart. And I just would want to see that um, in, in, in reality across all our universities. Your experience and also your journey with us. Now, before you go, um, what would be your advice to young African students who are hoping to study abroad? And also, how can alumni and educational stakeholders continue to support initiatives just like the GRASAC USA? All right. So we always talk about brain drain, right? And the, when we look at, so when you look at the rate at which Africans or Ghanaian um, grad, graduate students are coming into diaspora, especially in the United States for the last academic year, we had more than 6,000 graduate students from Ghana alone in coming to the United States to study. And this year is going to be more than that. So we are always behind Nigeria, which is um, the giant in um, um, postgraduate education outside the continent and, and, and is very beautiful. But this year, I think we're able to match them boot for boot. We had about 6,400 and something according to those, um, um, report that was released in November 2023. And so I'm hopeful that this year the numbers will, will increase. And so we talk about brain drain. Oh, they are all our best students are living in the country and um, they are going into other countries and all. But I think that that is what the government must tap into that resources. These students are coming into these um, academic spaces to study, to develop themselves, right? So how do we track them? How do we provide support? How do we provide that pathways that right after? So I'm sure the AAU hosts um, the Carnegie African Diaspora um, Fellowship Program. And that fellowship program 
through the Carnegie Corporation, creates the pathways for African scholars in the diaspora to provide support to their colleagues um, back, back on the continent. These are some of the pathways. It must not only be Carnegie's problem, it must be the government's problem. So, for example, the Ministry of Education in Ghana must better position itself to really tap into the, the skills, the knowledge, and the resources that these students who were trained in our universities are now um, doing so much well in, in the diaspora. They are doing so much well in universities in the United States. When I go through the profiles of our graduate student and I see their areas and their skills, and then the meetings, the ideas they share, these are very beautiful ideas that will advance our country, right? And so how are we tapping into that? So I think that the government, through the Ministry of Education, must be very much intentional in tapping um, these skills and resources and, and making sure that at least, even if they are not coming directly to Ghana or to Africa to work, there is a pathway that they will be able to leverage and then share their skills and knowledge and all. So we have a lot of academic mobility um, for both professors and students, but we can also continue to do acad academic mobility or some sort of mobility for these practitioners to really um, um, do that. When we had our Congress, we had students who presented their research on, on cancer, right, and how they are using mathematical computation in in solving um, cancer-related issues in the United States. And I was just asking myself, how can these professionals give back to, to Ghana, right, to our cancer research or our cancer treatment centers in Ghana? We had people to kidney and, and a lot of um, some, they are doing wild stuff, I might say, right? Everybody who is in grad school here, when you look at their research projects and the things they are doing, they are very innovative. They are kind of finding real-time solutions to problems. But at the end of the day, some of these solutions will be packed in the United States. When I publish a paper, right, the paper belongs to, to my institution and I'm affiliated to my institution. When you are counting research um, knowledge and how African or the, the regional knowledge production my research will be counted as that of the United States, but it will not be counted as, oh, this is an African who published this. This is someone from University of Cape Coast from and all of that. So we need to be very, very intentional as, as higher education um, institution, not just in Ghana, but across the continent, to really turn ourselves to, into the resources that are generating, the knowledge that they are sharing, the skills that they are giving, to the institutions in the diaspora. We need to be very much intentional about that. That is one of the things that nobody cares in Ghana, right? When I finish my PhD, nobody cares whether I need to give back to Ghana or not. I would want to find work in the United States or want to find work elsewhere, right? But because I had the opportunity to work in an institution that I saw the major problems on the continent and went ahead to do PhD in it, I still feel that obligation that I need to really give back to the continent. But most people do not have that um, that culture because, well, they left Ghana because of some hardship. Nobody needed them. They went through a lot of difficulties. But I think these are conversations that even as GRASAC, we are having uh, with our members to, to help them so even after their PhDs, give back to the institutions that they came from, give back to the communities that they came from. And that is the only way that we'll be able to develop Ghana and develop the African continent um, in, in general. So that is the few that I just want to share, positioning ourselves to tap into the resources that our students really um, have in the, in the diaspora. And I think that is one of the things that will help us advance. Right, right. Thank you once again for joining us um, today. And just like you made mention, we are looking forward to um, seeing the impact of the diaspora in African higher education. So that was uh, Mr. Kwesi Akwasam, um, the seat president of the Graduate Students Association of Ghana, USA, and also a doctoral student at the University of Maryland. He shared with us his experience his journey, and also vision for the future of African higher education. We'll go for a quick break when we come back. We'll continue with um, today's episode. 
Hey, so this is Dishan from Unica University Common Application. I recommend you to watch AAU Television. AAU TV is the place to be for every person in higher education in Africa. Better be there or be nowhere. Continue to watch the TV and especially on the AAU. Keep watching it and it will change the way you interact with higher education on the continent. AAU, great job. I want to tell you that AAU Television is fantastic. It's educative, it's informative, and it is a must for anybody who is interested in higher education in Africa. When I was in Accra last year, I did an interview on this TV. It's a very important mouthpiece. It's a data, it's, it's a bank of all we need for the development of higher education in Africa. People should make an effort to view it because it discusses very current issues of development across the continent. I believe that the station will continue to promote the overall development of Africa, particularly in the tertiary education sector. AAU TV provides a platform and shares a lot of information to a broader audience. So we wish you all the best and please continue serving AAU TV. The voice of higher education in Africa.